my life. Lord, I surrender. One day is better with you than all the world. Oh, Spirit of life, help me remember that it is my pleasure to say morning church and welcome. We're so glad that each and every one of you are with us. It's so good to gather in God's house today. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. To our guests who are with us, thank you for being here today. We welcome you. Uh, We look forward to getting to know you and having you a part of our our church today. Those of you joining us online, we're so glad to have you each and every week. And I'm thankful that we have uh, the opportunity to connect with people far beyond the walls of this church on Sunday morning uh, and beyond. But there's nothing quite like being in the room together worshiping together. I hope that you get our our weekly digital bulletin. If you don't, uh, then let us know. Contact the office. We want to make sure you receive that in your inbox on Sunday mornings uh, before church so that you know what's happening and going on uh, in the life of our church. And so uh, I just wanted to take a brief moment to say uh, we're glad that you're here. Thank you so much uh, for being here. It's going to be a great day of worship. Uh, And I want to lead us in a word of prayer before we sing together today. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for life today. I'm grateful for the chance to worship today. 
Lord, as we sing these songs of praise to you, may we think about what it is we're singing and who it is we're singing it to. And Lord, as we hear your word and engage with your word today, as we spend time in prayer today, in this worship gathering, that God, you would shape our hearts to you, that you would open our, our minds and our ears, that we might hear you clearly, discerning in which way it is you're speaking into our hearts and our lives so that we can be changed by you, that we can be transformed by your grace. And that as we leave this place today, as we've just heard in this song, that we would live in such a way that there would be no doubt that our life is defined by Jesus, a Jesus who died for us, a Jesus who sacrificed himself for us so that we could receive him in faith, seeing that he conquered death by rising again, and that if he's more powerful than death, then he's more powerful than anything we're going to face in this life. Lord, may we seek to be defined by you. Thank you again for the chance to worship today. Be with your church, your people, and help us to experience you in a fresh new way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand at this time. We're going to read God's word from Philippians chapter 2. That's right. Many of you in small groups have studied this passage this morning. Philippians chapter 2. Will you read this with me? Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing together. Let our praise be a welcome Let our songs be a sign, we are here for you. up a shout, let us shout, be your anthem, your renown, fill the sky, we are here for you, oh Lord, we are here for you, let your word move in power, let what's dead.
welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every voice be raised. Let all creation sing. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul about him. Let's sing this together. There's a reason I can see. There's a reason for this joy inside me. One name above all names. Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. There's a reason for this hope, there's a reason for this peace that I know, one worthy of all praise, Jesus, yes it's Jesus. Lord, we need this victory for the goodness of your grace each day. I will bow and bless your name. Jesus, I thank you, Jesus. I will lift my hands up. I will raise my voice high. I will shout of your love. Please be. 
be seated. It's so good to come together with God's people. Even before we take time to pray a prayer of thanksgiving, I'd like to invite you to just look around. Maybe you've never seen another person in this room before in your life. Or maybe you've been going to this church for 40 or 50 years. This church family is so special to gather with because when we come together, we are no longer individual worshipers, which we are through the week. We worship together as a unit, as a family. And we have the connection with one another through Jesus Christ that we don't have every moment as individual worshipers. Through the week. And I'm so grateful to get to gather with each and every one of you. Today we're going to focus on thanking God for what he has done through salvation. So the first thing, yes, the first thing I'd like us to thank God for is that Jesus redeemed us. There's a verse you can look at and read and thank Jesus in your silent prayer now for purchasing us through his blood and forgiving our sins. Will you please? And next, I'd like us to, to pray, thanking God for justifying us, for making us right with him when we believe in him. You can read this script, pray this prayer of God. And finally, will you join me in praising God, the Holy Spirit, for transforming us into the image of Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for being at work inside of us. For those who have believed, we recognize that you have been, are being, will be working all of us. God, we thank you for making us holy in your life, for forgiving our sins, for setting us on a new path where we 
not only can follow you, but help others find and Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the many blessings, the people, the things, the experiences in our lives. This morning, we thank you for just being who you are and for the work that you are doing in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let's sing of the work that Jesus did on the cross. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all
We'll find Mark chapter 1, the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As we continue our series, we started last week. We're going to walk through, journey through this gospel uh, together. And uh, so today we're going to look at at a message entitled, Now is the Time. Uh, So most all of you know we have three boys, and they all arrived and came uh, in their own unique way. Uh, But one thing that was the same uh, in all of that was the preparation uh, for those those boys coming into our lives, for those kids coming into our lives, the anticipation. Uh, With our our first one, he was uh, scheduled induction early in the morning, and we had prepared and and planned and had everything uh, going according to schedule, and we had all the the stuff lined out, and everything was good to go, and got to the hospital, and we were there all day, and we were there all day evening and things just weren't quite going as as planned and two minutes before midnight ended up having an emergency c-section and welcoming our first child into the world our first son and then a few years later our second one came and he too was scheduled but this time was a scheduled uh, c-section but two days before that early in the morning we realized, oh, it's time, and now is the time, and we rushed to the hospital, and at 9 a.m. on the dot, he was born, and then our third one, three and a half years, paperwork, fundraising, more paperwork, more waiting, more setbacks, more fundraisers, and finally, we got a call a week before Christmas after three and a half years. And now it's time. And so we begin making preparations. And we had a couple of months timeline before we were to travel overseas to, to Columbia uh, to meet him and bring him home. And, uh, and then we're working things out. And, and the plan changed a little bit. And then they called us on a, on a Thursday and said, you know, next, next Thursday is, is the day you're going to leave. And so now is the time. And then an hour later they called and said, no, due to some circumstances, you're probably going to leave on, on Tuesday. Okay, well, now, now the time is, is sooner. And then uh, we got another phone call literally like 30 minutes later that said, you're leaving on Sunday morning. And we said, oh, so 72 hours is the time. Now is the time. And there was excitement. And we went to Columbia and brought our, our third son home. And, and every situation was unique. But there came that moment where we realized this is happening. And now is the time. What we've prayed for, what we've waited for, what we've prepared for, it's happened. Now's the time. Let's go. A similar thing happened in the story of Jesus that Mark tells us in chapter 1. When Jesus began his public ministry, it became clear that now is the time. We pick up in verse 14 where we left off last week where Mark writes, after John was arrested, John the Baptist, John the baptizer, the one who was going to prepare the way, the messenger who was coming before Jesus. After John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. You see, John was arrested. Actually, a better way to understand, John was handed over to the authorities and, and later would be killed. We'll read about that a few chapters later. And it made the way and opened up the door for Jesus to begin his public ministry. And in the same way, when we get towards the end of Jesus' story, On earth, we'll see too in the same way with the same language that Jesus was handed over to the authorities and later would be killed. So John's handed over and and Jesus steps in, and, and one day Jesus will be handed over and will be killed. So John's arrest and John's murder, as grim as that may be, led the way, opened up the door for Jesus to step on the scene and begin his public ministry. Now is the time. And Jesus' arrest and, and his crucifixion that would later come fulfilled the good news. It unleashed the power of God into the lives of his followers. And these new followers, these these new Christians, these first generation Christians, many of them would later themselves be handed over and killed for their faith. 
The progression of God's story, the progression of God's plan is working itself out through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes pass between what we saw last week with uh, uh, John baptizing Jesus to, to symbolize God's favor and God's blessing upon him and setting the example for us and his going into the wilderness and being tempted by Satan. And here, probably six months later, some say maybe even up to a year has passed between verse 13 and verse 14 that we saw just a moment ago. But Jesus' public ministry officially begins with this statement in verse 15, a statement that that really summarizes the entire story of Jesus and why he came. So so Jesus shares his big idea up front. He gives his his theme, his, his thesis, his purpose at the very beginning and then spends the rest of his life fleshing it out. He says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus says, now is the time. This is a decisive moment, a critical moment in history. For centuries, God's people have waited. God's people have prepared. God's people have anticipated the coming of Jesus, coming of the Messiah. And Jesus now proclaims, that the time has come, that he's arrived, and with it comes the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God. Now, that's a term we see and hear regularly throughout Scripture, and I think it's important that we understand what Jesus is talking about. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the reign of God in the hearts of his people. So so when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, when you see in Scripture the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is referring to the reign of God in the hearts of our people. Now, this is different than a physical king ruling and reigning over a group of people, over a country, over a nation. It's a spiritual rule. It's a different kind of kingdom than any other kingdom that people know. You see, the kingdom of God began through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus on earth. And it's going to be fully realized one day when Jesus returns to earth again in the future, just as he promised. So the kingdom of God has already begun, but the kingdom of God is not yet fulfilled. Jesus comes proclaiming the kingdom of God has come. Now is the time. But yet it's not fulfilled until Jesus comes again and makes all things right once and for all. And if we look at our salvation, if we look at our lives and those of us whose faith is in Jesus Christ as followers of Jesus and believers of Jesus, we see the kingdom of God represented in our salvation. Because the moment that we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we seek forgiveness of sins. We confess him to be Lord, boss of our lives, and we surrender control of our lives to him. At that moment, God's spirit enters into us and consumes us and takes control of us. And therefore, the kingdom of God has begun in us. But that's just the beginning of our salvation. Our salvation is not going to be fully realized. Our salvation is not going to be fulfilled until our time on earth is done and and we go to heaven to be in eternity with Jesus forever by his grace. And so for us, our salvation is the kingdom of God. Our relationship with Jesus is the kingdom of God. The reign of Jesus has begun in our hearts at the moment of salvation, but it won't yet fully be realized until we stand face to face with him in the glory of heaven. So Jesus says the kingdom of God has come. Now is the time. And so throughout his life, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God. We can know that it's reference to the reign of Jesus in the individual hearts of believers. And and, and then as more and more and more people surrender their hearts to the reign of Jesus, the kingdom begins to be built. More and more people become a part of of the kingdom, and it's going to collectively grow to be greater than any kingdom that's ever been before. So it's growing and and developing, and so how's Jesus going to establish his kingdom on earth? By calling people to put their faith in him. 
by calling people to follow him. He says, repent and believe the good news. God's plan for his kingdom to establish and to develop and grow his kingdom is to grow one person at a time. God's plan for his kingdom is to to grow one person at a time, one life at a time transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ. And every person that puts their faith in Jesus becomes part of the kingdom. And as more people put their faith in Jesus, the kingdom grows in a different and far less significant way. It's like me playing the board game Risk with my sons. I've beat them every time. I'm undefeated. I mean, they are just kids. I've only played once or twice. But one territory at a time, one person at a time, one soldier at a time, one army at a time, conquering a territory, conquering a nation, and by the end of the game, all the soldiers are red and all the other soldiers are dead. I've conquered the world. I'm the champion of risk in a much more significant way, not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. That's the plan of God. That's the purpose of Jesus, establishing his kingdom, his reign, his rule, and the hearts, one person at a time, one life at a time. And every person puts their faith in Jesus, and the kingdom begins to grow. And later, after Jesus ascends back to heaven, he sends his Holy Spirit, and he establishes the church, the local church, where kingdom people can gather, where kingdom people can come together to grow in their faith so that these kingdom people can go out and find other people to join the kingdom, to know Jesus, to follow Jesus. And they too can grow in their faith. And they too can go out and find new people for the kingdom. And it grows and it grows. And the spiritual reign of Jesus grows. One person at a time. One life at a time. And so the preaching and the teaching and the healing ministry of Jesus is going to expose the world to the love of God and the sovereignty of God. And that's why Mark tells the story of Jesus. Because God wants a relationship with every single person that he created in his image and his likeness. And we'll see in these next verses what it takes to, to follow Jesus once you've put your faith in Jesus. But in order to know Jesus, in order to have a relationship with him, we've got to repent. We've got to believe the good news. That's Jesus' message. That's the message of the kingdom of God. To repent to change your mind, which leads to changing your behavior. Our minds have to change, and our behavior has to change. It involves a rational decision and willful action. And Jesus calls us to reverse the direction of our lives away from selfishness, away from worldly desires, and go the way in which he leads us to go. Repentance means to turn around and go the other direction. It doesn't mean just just back away from. So, So we're living this worldly life and we're living for ourselves and we're pursuing the things of this world that that look good and, and, and sound good and smell good and maybe even temporarily taste good. But Jesus is calling us to a different life. And he's not just calling us to back away from the direction we're going, to back away from the things of this world. Because we may be tempted to take a big step back and and say, I'm going to back away from that. I'm going to try to avoid that. We may be fighting against it, and we may be taking baby steps backward. And we we might do it smooth and finesse and moonwalk backward. But I'm not going to do that. But what happens is when we back away from it, we still see it. We still hear it. We can still smell it. And like those cartoons with the the, the luring good smell that lures them back into a trap, we walk back towards what it is that's tempting us and drawing us to him. That's not what Jesus is saying when he says, repent and believe the good news. He's saying, turn away and turn your back to it so you don't see it, you don't hear it, you're not tempted by it. And walk this way in the direction of Jesus and the way he wants you to go 
surrendering the whole of your life to him. That's the message of Jesus. That's what Jesus is calling us to do, to turn away, to repent. And once we turn away from our sins, we're called to wholeheartedly put our faith in Jesus above all else. We're commanded to live in a continuous state of repentance and faith, repentance and trust, and declare, God, I'm turning away from blank. I'm turning away from this, and I'm turning towards you. I'm pursuing this. I'm, I'm wanting this. I'm desiring this. But God, I'm turning away from that, and I'm turning towards you and what you want for my life and what's best for my life. And this isn't going to happen until we see that we have a problem. It isn't going to happen until we understand that Jesus is the only solution. And Jesus came with a message of hope. Jesus came and provided a way for us to be eternally forgiven and to made new. But the biggest hurdle in the kingdom of God, the biggest hurdle with this message of Jesus is we don't welcome repentance because we don't like being told to change. We get offended when people tell us we need to change. We need to do something different. We need to be something different. We're usually stubborn and don't, don't recognize and realize the reality of our own sin. We often like to to put the blame on something else or to put the blame on someone else. And Jesus faced this all through his ministry. That's why he said the kingdom of God is radical and it's just, it's an upside down kingdom and it's different than any other kingdom we could experience and we could know. But he remained faithful to his calling. He fulfilled his purpose by dying for us and rising from the dead. Jesus came proclaiming the good news of the gospel, and with that, promised to change our lives if we're willing to follow him. Look at what he says after declaring that the kingdom of God has come and calling people to repent and believe the good news. Picking up in verse 16, as he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them. And I'll make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat putting their nets in order. Immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now is the time. And Jesus is ready to begin his public ministry by equipping his chosen disciples to preach and to teach and to lead the way in sharing this good news of the gospel, this good news of Jesus, the Son of God. And his call is compelling, and and these men choose to, to follow Jesus. No hesitation, no reservations. They respond in faith, and they walk away from what they're doing to follow Jesus. What is God calling you to walk away from so that you can follow him? Or who? Who's God calling you to walk away from so that you can follow him? You see, Jesus is is building his team. He's putting together the guys that he wants to train up, to invest, and empower to live out the gospel. Now, these are ordinary men. Uh, These are not all all stars. They're, They're common people who were called to an uncommon mission. And in this culture, it's interesting, another backwards way of the kingdom of God and how Jesus operates, when a disciple wanted to learn, when a disciple wanted to to follow the law, they would go and they would seek out a teacher. They would go seek out the rabbi. They would go find and seek out a rabbi, and and they would request to be taught by this rabbi, to, to follow this rabbi, to learn from this teacher. But even in that, When they would connect with a rabbi or a teacher, their ultimate allegiance was still to the law and not to the rabbi and not to the teacher. And it was very common in their culture to seek out a rabbi, to seek out a teacher so that they could better learn and follow the law. But Jesus' form of discipleship is radically different, which displays how the kingdom of God is radically different. Jesus seeks out 
his students. He seeks out his disciples and he calls them. And he calls them not to allegiance to the law, but allegiance to him and to follow him and to to serve him and to, to emulate him. And when Jesus calls us to follow him, it's a call to receive his grace and surrender to his ways. It's not a call to improve yourself or try to be a better person. It's a, it's a call to be shaped and molded by the person of Jesus. So Jesus didn't post the job openings and review the resumes and conduct the interviews. Jesus went out among the people. He met them where they were. And he saw them Not for who they are, but he saw them for who they could become if they were willingly able and willing to surrender their lives fully to him. And see, the purpose of Jesus' call is people. He was calling these men to reach people with the good news. And and, and church, we're not called to programs. We're not called to buildings. We're not called to events or conventions or any of the like. We're first and foremost called to people. Helping people find and follow Jesus. And this is the call of Jesus on these men. This is the call of Jesus on all of us, helping people find and follow Jesus. But what does it take to follow Jesus? What does it take to follow Jesus? Following Jesus takes radical surrender. I don't know how else to say it. Following Jesus takes radical surrender. Peter, Andrew, James, and John the first four of the 12 disciples that Jesus called, were willing to immediately walk away from what they were doing to follow Jesus. They quickly and completely responded to God's call. And when Jesus calls us to follow him, when Jesus calls us to serve him, we don't need to ask when because the answer is always now. And once we clearly see what Jesus asks us to do, what Jesus is calling us to do, our obedience ought to be immediate. These men walked away from their livelihood. Their lives were centered on being fishermen. They, they lived on the, the Sea of Galilee. They, they fished for a living. That's how they survived. That's how they provided for themselves. That's how they provided for their families. That was their, their trade. That was their skill. That was what they knew more than anything else. James and John walked away from their family and their business at the same time because their family business was fishing. They left security. They left familiarity. They left their current identity so they could find a new identity in Jesus Christ. And they understood that who they were surrendering to was much more fulfilling than what they were stepping away from. There was so much more fulfillment in following the unknown radical Jesus than there was in the the comfortable familiarity of a life of fishing. You see, following Jesus is costly. It's not some pie-in-the-sky fairy tale fantasy. Jesus calls us to lay it all down for him. And to follow him. And I think we often fail to understand what it really means and truly means to follow Jesus. It's not following our own path or only what's comfortable or convenient or consulting Jesus and trying to convince him of our way and saying, hey, well, I, you know, I prayed about it or I talked to God about it and this is what I'm going to do. It's about going the direction Jesus leads you to go. And even that term follow in our current culture is so so skewed and so messed up because we think of following in terms of, you know, keeping up with or paying attention to what's going on, mostly in the realm of social media. We quote unquote follow people. We try to get people to follow us on social media. 
on TikTok, on Instagram, on, on, on Twitter, on, on Facebook. And in this context, follow means seeing what's going on with them, keeping up with what's happening, maybe interacting in some way, or maybe even being influenced by someone else in the way that we follow them. And when we don't like what they have to say, or we're no longer entertained by them, or we're less interested in the content that they're posting, we can very easily and quickly unfollow them with one click of a button. Jesus wasn't looking for a group of friends to hang out with and have a good time. Jesus was calling ordinary men to an extraordinary task of taking the revolution of the gospel to the ends of the earth. He wanted to change the trajectory of their lives for the better and wanted to impact them and others for eternity. But in order for this to happen, Jesus demanded more. And following Jesus means that he has priority over everything. It means if we're truly going to follow Jesus, And the way that Jesus calls us to follow him, that means Jesus gets priority in our family. He gets priority in our our parenting and our grandparenting. Jesus gets priority on our calendar and with our schedule. It means that Jesus gets priority in our finances and how we spend our money. It means Jesus gets priority in, in our jobs and our school. And in every other element of our lives. And this call of Jesus to discipleship is a call to fully embrace the values of Jesus. And if we're truly following Jesus, the whole of our lives is centered on the commands of Jesus and the truth of his word. And I'll say this. God may not always call us to literally abandon everything. He doesn't always call us specifically to walk away from our job and our livelihood. He doesn't specifically and always call us to sell all of our stuff or to take a different job or to quit our job or to move to another place. But if we're following Jesus in the way that Jesus wants us to follow Jesus, if he says so, we'll do it. If he says so, we'll obey. Quickly and completely. Not just, okay, God, I'll, you know, I'll, give, a, I'll give a little bit of my you know, time away, or I'll give a little bit of my money away, or I'll let, I'll let you control this, this portion of my life. No, he wants the whole of your life. It's all or nothing. Either you're all in or you're all out. And our greatest potential to impact others comes through following Jesus. And this story about Jesus calling these men to radically surrender to him, it's pretty radical, right? He just says, he's walking down the beach and he says, hey, come follow me. I mean, and they just, I mean, they just jump out of their boat, swim to the shore and take off and they just leave it behind. Maybe God's calling us to that in some way or some form, but it's not just in this unique setting. This is not just a, a cool Bible story that we can learn from and say, yeah, that was cool. Those guys were, were radical. Jesus later extends this call to every single believer, every single person who's willing to follow him and willing to surrender themselves to him. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, we'll get there. Calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know, we sing that old hymn, Oftentimes, an invitation at the end of a service. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And it says, though, though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. You see, these disciples weren't turning back. These disciples were all in. They were willing to go with Jesus wherever he went or wherever he told them to go. And as I was preparing this message this week, a song, an old song, 
came to my heart and came to my mind. The old hymn written by B.B. McKinney, wherever he leads, I'll go. And one of the verses he writes, it may be through the shadows dim or over the stormy sea. I take my cross and follow him wherever he leadeth me. And the chorus says over and over again, I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. These are examples of what it truly means to follow Jesus with radical surrender. But let me warn you, singing them doesn't make us true followers of Jesus. Living them does. Make sure that you're not just following the rules or the the cultural expectation of Christianity, but that indeed you're truly following Jesus. And may Jesus Christ, who loves us so, Make us willing to surrender and honestly say and live that wherever he leads, I'll go. Now is the time to radically surrender to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to pray. I'm going to ask you to take a moment in the stillness of this service before we sing one more song together. To evaluate in your heart and ask God in your heart, what, what, what level of, of fellowship do you have with Jesus? How well are you following him? And see if there's any place, any pocket, any nook and cranny, any closet of your life that you need to fully surrender to Jesus today. Or or maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've you've followed the rules and you've you've been a good person and you've come to church. Maybe even you've walked an aisle and maybe even gone so far as to be baptized, but you've never truly been changed by Jesus. Your heart's never been transformed. The surrender's never been complete. Maybe it's been one foot in and one foot out. And maybe today, he's calling you to to wholly and completely surrender to him. Heavenly Father, only by the power of your spirit can you touch our hearts and transform our lives. And God, I pray in this moment that you would meet us at the deepest place of our hearts, in the depths of our souls. And help us to see if we're truly following you. If we're truly embracing the power of the kingdom of God and the reign of Jesus in our lives. And if not, today would be the day of salvation. But also today might be a day of renewal and restoration for those that know you. That you would clean out some dark areas of our heart and our life and expose them in the light so that we can confess them, so that we can repent, we can turn and walk away and never look back as we seek to follow you. Father, thank you for this radical call to follow you because it's this radical call that's going to transform our lives. It's this radical call that's going to give us a greater purpose than we've ever had before. So God, transform us and change us and speak to us in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand. We invite you to stand. We invite you to sing. Continue to contemplate the truth of God's word this morning. If you need prayer, if you've got a decision you need to make, whatever that may be, God's prompting you. Meet me here at the front. Let me pray with you. Let me encourage you. Let me lead you in whatever decision you need to make.
Let's sing. All I am, Lord, here before you, reaching out for me. You're the promise, never failing. You are my reward. You are my reward. I let go of all I have just to have all of you. And no matter what the cost, I will follow you, Jesus, everything I'm lost, I have found in you. When I finally reach the end, I'll say, you are worth it all. There's no riches or earthly treasure will satisfy every longing for you Jesus set this heart on I will follow you, Jesus, everything I've lost, I have found in you. When I finally reach the end, I'll say, you are worth it all. You are worth it all. When I'm there, glorious presence every knee is bowed before you hear the sound of heaven singing you are worth it all all the saints cry holy holy angels singing worthy worthy forever i will shout your praises you are worth it all when i'm there in your glorious presence Every knee is bowed before you, hear the sound of heaven singing, you are worth it all. All the saints cry, holy, holy, angels singing, worthy, worthy, forever I will shout your praises, you are worth it all. everything I've lost I have found in you when I finally reach the end I'll say you are worth it all you are worth it Thanks so much for joining us for our worship experience. Whether you're joining us live on Sunday morning or whether it's at another time during the week, we're so grateful that you've chosen to participate with us this week. If you want to know more uh, about what's going on in the life of our church, make sure you're receiving our digital bulletin. You can find it on our website, but you can also contact us and give us your email address and you'll receive that every Sunday morning in your inbox. You can also give online through our website. Uh, much of our giving takes place in that manner, and we're so grateful to have the technology to be able to do that. And so you can find that information on our website and here on the screen as well. Uh, to our guests, 
Thank you for being with us today. We want to connect with you. We want to get to know you better. We have a connection card, a guest card that's available on our website as well. Please fill that out and reach out so that we can have some information about you. We want to get to know you better. We want to share with you more about the life of our church. I want to invite all of you who are joining us online to join us in person on Sunday mornings. Our small groups, our Bible study classes are meeting together at 9 a.m. in person now uh, after over a year of doing online only. And we're so grateful for that. So join us at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. There's a group, a class for you, at any age, any phase of life. And especially we want you to join us for worship at 1030 on Sunday mornings right here uh, in our sanctuary. We're so thankful. Uh, for each and every one of you. We're so thankful to be able to worship together, to share God's word together, to pray together. Is there a decision that God's calling you to make? Has God spoken to you in a special way today? Maybe he's challenged you with something uh, that you need to do in your life, some areas of your life that you need to, to renew or to refocus. Uh, maybe there's a burden for some prayer needs in your life. We have a place where you can share prayer requests and we would love to pray with you and for you for whatever it is that you need that you want us to pray about. But most importantly, we want you to know that we want you to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I know that in my life, uh, all the years that I've followed him and served him and trying to grow in my faith and better understand who he is and better understand his purpose for my life, I can't imagine navigating the difficulty of life without a personal relationship with him. You can surrender your heart to Christ today. We would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ and to give your life to Him. And we also want to help you get connected in ways that you can serve right here in our church, in our community. We're excited about partnering with many organizations in our community, partnering with other believers and other groups within our church to help meet the needs inside the church and outside in the community. And all that we strive to do, our purpose, our mission, our goal is helping people find and follow Jesus. So come and join us and be a part of what God is doing here at South Hills Baptist Church.